have less hours. It doesn't mean though you still can't achieve something. Yeah. Uh, but maybe look for, you know, and if you are wanting to race, look for the kinds of races that you feel you can train for and you have enough time for, or maybe pick certain times of year that you go after things. And, and that will come up and it, it has to take a priority sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, I think being a bit self-compassionate about that um, and accepting that that's how it is and taking that time, doing what you need to do and then, you know, coming back to it again. Hi, Vicky. Welcome to the Working Athlete Podcast. Great to have you here. You head an organization uh, that teaches people, um, you know, how to do well in leadership coaching, right? You uh, coach people to do well as a leaders, or how to uh, be great leaders, so to speak. So, um, and you are an athlete as well. Uh, uh, you are a great cyclist who have who has participated in. Um, uh, races at the highest level in amateur uh, category, right? UCI Grand Fond of Finals. Right? I think you great a great guest for uh, the Working Athlete Podcast, uh, a great ambassador for the podcast, so to speak. So great to have uh, have you here. So I want to start with um, your, you know, how it all started uh, for cycling mm. well firstly thank you for having me as a guest being your second guest i think so that's um that's a great honor and um yes so i i i do have um a consulting business in leadership and yes i'm also quite a passionate cyclist and cycling for me started um in well, I first got interested in cycling in 2010 and um, I went to see um, my husband, who was then my partner, Harry Menon. I went to see him off on the 2010 Tour of the Nilgris. Nice. And um, I was quite curious because there were all these kind of people in Lycra heading off for a week. And I had no idea that there was anything like that happening in South India. So that got my curiosity. I was actually going off to Sri Lanka to do yoga over the same period of time. Um, but I thought, oh, wow, okay, there's this whole world out there. Right. So that's how you kind of discovered cycling. Yeah, uh, that was my first glimpse, certainly, of, of some of the things that were happening in the cycling world. But how did you get started on that journey? Well, when I came back from that yoga holiday, um, Harry had bought me um, a bike, yeah. which was, um, it was um, a hybrid Bianchi. So uh, I started riding it and um, on the highways at, in and around Bangalore. And um, I found that I enjoyed it and it was a lot of fun. So that was how I initially got started. Okay. So you mentioned uh, about yoga, uh, going to yoga retreat uh, around that time. So mm -hmm. have, have you always been uh, an active person, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, I grew up um, in a family that, you know, I was taken out in long walks from a very young age and um, I rode horses and did lots of sport in school. So, yeah, I would say that I was, though there was a phase in my life when I went to university um, and perhaps also when I was working in London where exercise wasn't such a big part of my life. Um, but um, that changed when I, when I moved to India um, and um, I just started having more time and more opportunity to get out in the outdoors. Um, so, yes, yeah. Um, and yoga happened for me when I, when I moved to Bangalore and I found my first yoga teacher and, um, it would have been something I'd wanted to do for a long time. And I started doing Hatha yoga Yeah. and 
um, loved that. That really became part of my life. And then I progressed to doing some Iyengar yoga and then eventually to Ashtanga yoga, which is the practice I, I still do today. Okay, great. So you mentioned uh, moving to India. When was this? Um, I moved to India in 1992, which seems like a very long time ago now. Yes, yes. It is a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. So you now moved back to um, Ireland, right? I did. Yes. On the 31st of January this year, I moved to Ireland thinking that I'd be coming back and forth to India regularly because I still have a business in India and a lot of my heart is still in India. But um the COVID pandemic has changed all that. And it's really strange to think that I, I'm not going to visit India this year. And it would be the first time in my life in 25 years that I've been out of the country for so long, probably out of the country for more than two consecutive months, actually. So yes, um, I think it's going to be next year before I set foot back in Bangalore. Okay, okay. So uh, you mentioned uh, riding horses. Tell me about mm -hmm. that. Um, well, I love horses, have done all my life, and I was lucky to grow up initially in the countryside, and, and we had um, a horse at home, and I just fell in love with horses, like many actually little girls do, and my dream was always to have my own pony, and I used to go to the local riding school and ride every weekend, and then um, when I turned 12, I actually got my first pony, and then from the time of sort of being 12 till I left school, um, I was very passionate about um, horse sports and I did a lot of show jumping and um, horse trials and um, yeah, I, it was a lot of fun. It was something that I, both my parents were amazing about taking me off to events at the weekend and um, I was, yeah, totally consumed actually by my passion and love of horses. I mean, not just riding them, but the whole kind of relationship that you have with another animal. Right. So uh, was it a strenuous uh, activity, horse riding? It is at a competitive level um, because to ride a cross country course, you need to be pretty fit. Uh, so yes, I mean, you think that you're just sitting on a horse, but actually to, you know, it's a bit like the difference between competitive cycling and just going out for an easy ride to okay. do it well. Yeah, you do need to be fit and brave actually as well. Yes, I can tell you are both of that. So what were you uh, kind of doing uh, at that time to keep yourself fit? Well, it's easy when you're that age, right? <laughs> you, don't have to, you don't have to work very hard at it. It changes later in life. So um, I suppose just doing sport in school and, and riding as much as I could. And of course, um, looking after the horse, because there's a fair degree of work in cleaning the stable and sweeping the yard. And I actually used to help out in the riding school to subsidize the cost of keeping my pony because um, it, it's expensive. And um, it was a way of reducing the cost was to sort of help out on the weekends and in holidays. So even actually age sort of 13, 14, 15, we would work really hard because we would be you know, leading ponies when people couldn't ride very well, sweeping things, cleaning stables, you know, do, going out and catching ponies, doing all kinds of things, actually. All right. So that, uh, that passion with the horses continued uh, when you came, back, uh, came to India as well? Yeah, I kind of rediscovered it because when I first came out to India, I was living on a tea estate up in the Nilgiris. And there were a couple of horses up there, um, retired horses from the race course. So I started riding those horses and then I got a couple more of my own. And um, yeah, I got very actually involved in helping the equestrian scene in South India get going and starting some competitions up and encouraging people to get into riding. And there was a reason for this was to also try and find something for ex race horses to do when they left the race course, because there wasn't much for them. So it was also about kind of finding the horses a purpose in life. And we started up the South India Equestrian Association, 
And um, that was, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And that was before I sort of took a break from work initially when I moved to India and, and I had a bit more time to do that. Um, and it was, yeah, great learning. So what was uh, these horses, uh, uh, the events are mainly those retired race horses? Yeah, yeah, that was, I mean, so it's interesting in India, and there still is to an extent, there's the army, and then there's the civilians. And there are, the army has a lot of horses. So if you grow up, your parents there, or you're in a regiment that allows it, you can ride horses. So there was quite a big scene there. But then civilians who didn't have that access, there were very limited horses for them to ride. So um, taking horses from the race course that had finished their racing career and retraining them so that you could, you know, ride them just for fun or if you wanted to jump or do dressage. And um, yeah, that's not an easy thing to do because racehorses are quite temperamental. They're a bit like road bikes, actually. Right. You know, things can go wrong very easily. Uh, so um, yeah, it, it has its challenges. But in fact, that sport has evolved a lot in India since those days. I'm talking the sort of mid 90s. And now quite a lot of people have imported horses into India and the whole sport has grown and evolved. And actually one of the lovely things is to see some of the kids that I saw starting out, you know, are now really accomplished horse people and they're representing India and doing really well actually, especially in events in Asia. So that's, that's lovely to see how that's all grown. Wow. Wow. So you helped start uh, something very, uh, very nice there, I think. Yeah. Well, I did my little bit and yeah, yeah, it was, I got, I got a lot of fun, fun out of it too. Great. So from horses to um, uh, riding horses to riding cycles. So how mm. did, yeah. How, how does it compare? Um, well, <laughs> <laughs> it would surprise you, but it's actually a little bit less expensive. <laughs> horses, horses have a very high ongoing maintenance cost. Right. Um, of course, you can spend, as we know, a lot of money on bikes too. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, it, it, I suppose it, you know it was driven a lot by. Um, I mean, it's great to to do a sport um, that your partner or spouse is also interested in. So it was partly about that. And it was also about um, community, actually, I think as well. Um, as I got into cycling, I really enjoyed the cycling community. And I think one of the things um, that we have in India, it's still fairly nascent. So it's a small community, but it means you form close friendships. Um, so I, I really enjoyed the cycling community and the fact that there's quite a mix of, of people um, and it is possible to cycle with, without necessarily being wealthy. Um, horses, horses, especially in India, are, are, tends to be more of an elite sport. And it, it's interesting in Ireland, because we have a big farming community that rides, it's perhaps a little bit less so. Okay. So I think I enjoyed the diversity of the cycling community. And um, it just, yeah, it just sort of seemed to suit the point that I was at in my life 10 years ago. Right. So you started uh, cycling in uh, late 2010, early 2011. So to yeah. Speak, right. Yeah. I so did. and uh, 2011, how uh, how was those uh, how were those initial years of cycling? The learning. Oh, of, big yeah. adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, just learning to. I mean, just learning how, you know, going from, first of all, riding a hybrid to then um, riding the old Merida road bike that Harry had, which was actually much too big for me. Um, and then he got a new Willia bike and I tried riding that and I discovered what a kind of fancy carbon fiber bike is like. So, of course, I then wanted one of those. And um, I got a Colnago, I think, in August 2011 thanks to uh, Venki at Wheel Sports. Yeah. I think I was one of the people who actually got a bike really fast from Venki. <laughs> and um, within a few days of getting that bike, I, I, we, went to, we decided to cycle up to the Nilgris. So I rode from Bangalore to Mysore, and then in one day, and then the next day we rode up to uh, the Mudamalai Forest, 
And then um, a couple of days later, I rode up the Seagor Guard, which was quite an experience because yeah. I'd only just started riding with cleats. And um, I was amazed that I, I made it up, actually. I really didn't think that there was any chance that I could ride up Kalhati or the Seagor Guard, as we call it. So, so it was kind of a bit of a, a trial by fire, fire, I suppose, that those first few months. <laughs> Yes, yes, it definitely sounds like that from riding a hybrid to, you know, just getting started to riding up Kalahati is uh, quite a jump in just a few uh, months, I think. Yeah. But, so um, how was, uh, was that year also your first TFN? Yes, that's when you and I first rode TFN together. It was, yes. And that was... That was another huge adventure because the first day riding from Bangalore to Mysore, I was so tired when I got there um, because I just wasn't used to that type of, of physical challenge. Mm -hmm. And I really, yeah, I really, it really stretched me mentally. And actually I arrived and um, I was sharing a room with two other people in, in the, you know, a fairly basic hotel in Mysore. And I just, left and decided to go and stay with a friend for the night in Mysore. I have a lot of yoga friends there and I just needed to sort of stay the night with somebody who, who I could sort of hang out with and say, wow, this was just like so difficult. So I did that and then um, came back the next morning and, 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 and it got easier in a way after that. But that first day was really tough. And, and I think what I learned was, um, you know, you can actually do so much more than you think, mm -hmm. um, but you do have to stick with it a little bit in the beginning. And it, you know, it does really, really stretch you when your body's not used to that kind of thing. And riding uh, uh, seven days uh, consecutively and nearly what, 800, 900 kilometers over many hills, that is quite an experience in the first year, yeah. of especially in the first year of cycling. Yeah, it was. And um, I mean, I was really lucky that year because I just took to it really fast and actually had a great tour. Um, I didn't even have a bike computer then, so there was no data. I was just kind of riding the bike. In fact, I, I remember wondering why people bothered with all those kind of things. But I was riding off my strength. I had a good core strength from yoga. So I actually, you know, did reasonably well and um, which of course is really encouraging. And um, yeah, that, you know, the, it was just a lot of fun and getting to know people. And I think also I knew the Nilgris cause I'd lived up there, but I'd never really seen them from the perspective of a bike before. Right. So it's just amazing. And we actually cycled, um, you know, to Kodnag, which is where I'd lived. I think we finished the tour that year at Kodnag, if I yes. remember right. Yes. We did um, the Kodnard viewpoint. Yeah, and that was very magical for me because there was something a bit about coming full circle because that's where I'd started my life in India was was living at Kodnard. Absolutely. And uh, that was the year in uh, TFN where the competitor section was also introduced. And I remember you, uh, a lot of uh, people were worried of uh, getting beaten by uh, a woman. But uh, what I felt amazing was uh, you were, you didn't have a cycle computer or anything, but you know, you were doing really well, having fun and doing great on the bike. And you uh, finished, uh, I think in top 10 out of that hundred mm -hmm. people. Uh, it yeah. was, it was very inspiring to see. And uh, let me uh, remind uh, in anyone listening that this was the first year of cycling that you were started. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of men did get beaten by a woman <laughs> that year. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I was just discovering really what I could do at that time. And that, you know, when you get new to a sport, if you do have a fair, fair degree of natural aptitude for it, then you do have a very exciting phase at the beginning because you can see a lot of gain in a, in a very short length of time. And I think I was really in that phase of, of cycling then. Um, but, you know, it was still tough too. I won't underplay. I, d I think you remember us cycling up to Uti after that climb. And um, <laughs> yeah, again, I bailed out a bit because we were all staying in the youth hostel, if you remember. Oh, yes, yes. And um, Harry and I went and booked a room at the Taj. And I always remember that night. 
having like this bath, this hot bath after being so cold that day. It was really the best bath I ever had in my life. Um, yeah. <laughs> makes total sense because um, it, the, uh, obviously uh, it was what third or fourth year of uh, TFN it, uh, and uh, that was the last year where we stayed in uh, YMCA I think after that mm. we, we got uh, you know better accommodation in Wooty especially because uh, you know staying there in cold nights I think is not very ideal but uh, it was tough yeah, yeah. I, I did stay there again on um another event that um Srinath organized but i managed to get a bucket of hot water i convinced one of the ladies who worked there to give me a bucket of hot water for a bath <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. great so that was your first tfn and uh, you did come uh, in participate in tfn uh, later on as well right mm, twice more yes um, I think, of course, Harry and I would tell you exactly the dates, but I did two more TFNs after that. Um, and I think it must have been probably 213 and 214. Okay. Um, the last one I, I, I did, I remember, because I did it with, um, with Namu and Nisha, uh, Misha and Vivek. And, that, um, that was yeah. 2014 which was yeah. uh, in my books one of the toughest uh, tfns to date uh, yeah. the ride to munnar and everything else was uh, simply mind blowing yeah yeah and i was coming back then from um having broken my collarbone so um cuz i had broken my collarbone racing in the rosnamon the um in september that year okay so I was actually using that TFN to try and sort of get my fitness and strength back again. So this, this was a race in uh, Ireland, uh, right? Yes. So Ross Namon is actually the biggest um, Irish women's race. And it, <laughs> how I ended up racing in that, it, I, I have to really ask myself that question because I was really way out of my league. Um, the race was at that time was sort of a mix of um, club, sort of top club riders, but also um, young up and coming pros and actually a few really good pros. We did have somebody there who was going on to race in the world championships, the women's, well, I'm mean, talking the professional world championships wow. in a couple of weeks, Taylor Wiles. So um, it was a mixed kind of peloton, but it was, yeah, it was actually way out of my league. Um, it was very challenging, but, but an amazing experience, I have to say. And um, you know, just seeing how the pros work and um, the kind of support system that they have around them and just having exposure to just how strong those women cyclists are. And we were cycling in the west of Ireland and the terrain is pretty tough. It's very windy and open. We had actually quite good weather. It, didn't, it wasn't very cold or wet, but it was incredibly tough um, riding out in the wind, and especially if you got dropped and you were out there on your own. Yeah. Um, and I actually, um, that, which is what happened to me. And the day that I broke my collarbone, I had got dropped and the, um, um, sweeper van was helping me get back to the Peloton, which was something they did in those days in that race, because they knew if you'd been dropped, you weren't going to win anything. So, so I was riding behind the van, which was tough in itself. Cause you really have to concentrate and just about to get back. And um, I, I hit a manhole in a village and went over, right over the front of the bike and um, landed on my head. But the funny thing was the um, ambulance, of course, checked me out because my helmet got smashed up and so on. So they were worried about my head. They had no interest in my collarbone. So <laughs> I, went into, they, I got into the ambulance and they sort of, you know, made me camp backwards and do all those things to make sure you're okay. And I kept saying, I think I've got a bit of a pain here, but, but, you know, nobody really took any notice of it. So I actually didn't go to the hospital till the, till about two days later. Um, when I, at which point I found out that I had, had broken it. Wow. And yeah. from uh, breaking that collarbone in September to getting back again, uh, and racing at TFN, uh, in December. Yeah, something. well, I actually had a surgery. When I came back to India, I got a plate put into my, so I have a titanium plate in my collarbone, which was the fastest way to get it to really heal well. 
Okay. So yeah, so I went through the surgery and then um, just started riding on the trainer and so on to to get back. Um, yeah. Wow, that was something. That was something. So I I see a bit of a trend here where uh, you constantly seem to be putting yourself in positions, uh, you know, that are uh, that many people consider uh, very tough, but also, you know, uh, discovering your strengths through doing something like that. Like, be it uh, uh, putting yourself in races that are that seem way out of your league, for the first TFN to that uh, 2008, uh, 14 race you just mentioned. Mm. Yes, Ross Namor, and it means actually the race of the women in Gaelic. Yeah, that was definitely kind of a, a, above my league, but but you know it was I, I did it, and yes, I think I was um, reflecting on on that that my and it's, this is not the approach for everyone, but my approach was to just throw myself in and see how I did, and um, it yeah, it's been interesting. It's you know it, as I said, it's not necessarily that I recommend that everyone does that. But um, that was the way cycling through those years went for me, for sure. Yeah. So um, kind of capping off the TFN experience, you won all those three years uh, at TFN, right? In women's I category. did, yes. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 th- I think I got a top 10 finish in the first two years. I'm not sure if I got a top 10 finish in the third year I did it, but I think it would have been at least in the top 15 um, cause they don't keep actually records of the race results online. So, um, yeah, yeah. Must, must be there on the blog still somewhere. Mm. Very nice. So let's, uh, what was your first group ride, so to speak, when you started cycling? Yeah, I was thinking about what that was and I, I mean, it must, so it would have been with Spectrum, I think, um, and, and it would have been in 2011. And I think in those days, we used to have our, our Saturday and Sunday rides. Mm-hmm. And if I remember on Saturdays, we used to ride up to Nandi from um, the old Madras Road, right? Yeah. That was typically the ride. Um, and then maybe on Sundays, we just stayed on the old Madras Road. So, so it would have been riding out with Spectrum and um, being the only woman in the group. Uh, and I know that for a lot of women, they worry about that um, because quite often as, as a woman cyclist, I think you do find yourself riding with men. Um, so, I mean, what was great for me was that somebody always sort of hung back, um, whether it was you or Mohan or Harry, um, and helped me get back on the group. And I just, again, it was kind of a, you know, I learned by getting out there and trying yeah. And I mean, I think that's the thing about group riding. It can be really daunting in the beginning because there's always our own ego about, you know, not being good enough or not being strong enough. Um, but the only way to get stronger is to just get out and do it. And if you can do it with people who, you know, will keep an eye out for you and, and look after you, that's the best thing. Yeah. Um, in Spectrum, we never knew for sure what the ride was going to be like. <laughs> <laughs> there yeah. was um and that might be the difference between say group rides in um in other parts of the world where you might be clearer that there's going to be a certain pace and then you might have say okay I'll I'll go for this ride because I know they're going to ride at this kind of pace and I should be reasonably close to being able to keep up with that yeah. um but we we would sort of just go out with spectrum and we'd see what would happen which was also a lot of fun and um, as like I said, someone would always keep an eye out for me, and you know, I'd, I'd sort of um, manage somehow to stay yeah. on, and then and then learn how to ride a wheel. That's the other thing as well, I think. Um, and I do see some people, you know, still not riding a wheel after cycling for a year or two, and and that's crazy because if you you know if you if you've got to learn to ride off people's wheels. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just way too hard. And, the, you know, the, what you get from drafting in cycling is just, I think it's about 30% extra speed. Definitely. So that's really critical. And then, of course, you have to trust the person whose wheel you're riding on. Yeah. And I, especially in the early days, I would always, you know, I would be careful about who I would ride right behind. And then I would just trust that person. Yeah. Um, 
excellent so that that was uh, uh, again uh, you know testing yourself uh, throwing yourself uh, in a kind of uh, uh, strong situation a tough situation and uh, learning out of it um so more recently you you were uh, you know you didn't need that uh, help of uh, you know people dropping back and uh, getting you back and all that so uh, you have become strong enough to even lead the rides uh, so to speak how how has that journey been what was the kind of you know things you uh, learned through the that journey um well i mean i certainly um again it does depend on who's riding and and what you know what what the ride pace is um well i've i've certainly learned the love of group riding and actually i've not been group riding since coming to ireland because just because of covid and various complications haven't joined up with a a group so harry and i have just been riding together and i do miss the group rides i mean i think it, it's i enjoy that that aspect of of riding with other people and catching up with them and chatting with them and you know trying out a few things together um so um but yeah it, it's it, it just doing it really um yeah. And, and some people like to ride on their own, you know. I mean, yeah. people are different, and that's fine too. Yeah. Um, you can have a lot of fun cycling or just riding with one other one other person. But I think if you're keen to get better and to grow as a cyclist, then you really need to ride with a group because that's where you'll start to discover, you know, what you can do, um, and they'll certainly up average speeds and you get and then there's the learning part that the people will just share their learning with you as you ride um because there is you know there's a lot to learn about cycling and um people will be generous with what they've learned and pass it on and that's great as well yeah i mean i used to feel very nervous about the group rides i remember yeah. um and trying not to do too much the day before you know so i wouldn't be too exhausted yeah. but now i'm kind of confident enough that that I'll just go along and see what I can do but there'll be plenty of group rides that you know I would I would still be very challenged to try and keep up with yeah. so here I would just pick carefully you know the right group yeah great so um so talking about uh, group rides and uh, uh, you know riding with teams uh, how has uh, when when did uh, you join spectrum racing and how uh, has that uh, experience yeah that's a good question because yeah. um i started off in um veloscope yeah and um i think i think spectrum must have been 2012 yes because yeah. i think you 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 went a little ahead from veloscope to spectrum and then and then harry and i moved after that so i did ride with veloscope before which was also actually a lot of fun and those would have been some of my early group rides right um but yes um spectrum i think spectrum's been um you know it's always there was a, a large group and there were very regular rides and i think also we're just all really good friends yeah which added to it too yes yes so come to think of it we have been uh, teammates for a long time uh, first with veloscope yeah. and then uh, spectrum racing Is yeah the, right the way through right the way through yes great what was your uh, first race was it tfn uh, 2011 then um well i yeah i'm trying to think when did i do i know i think in 2011 i did a few bbch races and i know the first i can't remember the date of it but i know the first race was um you know on the back roads near um the embassy riding school okay. and um we yeah because we used to have smaller races in those days and um yeah i think that must have been in 2011 um oh. there's some nice photos actually of us all at that at that race right. you were probably at it too yeah that that might be april 2012 the race you were oh, okay about. yeah you think so yeah, uh, you looked yeah. it up yeah all right so that was after tfn yes yeah Great. So from then to now, um, you have uh, raced uh, 
till last year here uh, how what what are the changes that you see in the racing scene here oh well it's grown a lot i mean it's yeah there's there's so many more people out cycling which is amazing and um i think um more kind of up and coming young cyclists i yeah. think maybe in those days um you know with with maybe greater aspirations than any of us really had which is wonderful to see and you know there's some good role models on that front you know people like well both the navines and and many more um so yeah so it's the the races are much bigger um i think bbch has also learned a lot about how to run races yeah. it's come a long way yeah. um since those days and uh, the, uh, the, it's a great point that you mentioned uh, a lot of uh, younger uh, riders now uh, as compared to back then right uh, mm. and also the their aims for uh, their goals uh, uh, were also changed i think grown from just doing well at bbcs to looking at nationals and even beyond some of them and the road models you mentioned navin john and navin raj and all these guys right they mm. yeah definitely they have uh, contributed immensely in terms of uh, you know structured training and all these power meters everything uh, has changed uh, i remember um, you know race, uh, racing uh, without uh, even cycling uh, cycle computers but now uh without power meter you you don't seem to be considered a serious cyclist so to speak so mm, yeah you know, come a long way so when it comes to women participation do you uh, see improvement there as well not really that's actually mm. um i i don't know that this I, i i'm not sure that it's really progressed that much mm-hmm. um we kind of seem to have these very fluctuating numbers Yeah. um so um it's going to probably take a little while longer i mean i i'm not surprised really because even if you look at women cycling say here in ireland it's also so much smaller than men cycling mm-hmm. and and you know here we have a great tradition we've had some amazing you know people like Sean Kelly and Stephen Roach and so on so um and you know we just had a couple of stage wins in the last tour de france as well with sam bennett so yeah, we've got yeah. you know we've got a quite a strong tradition of cycling um but still women cycling is is way behind the men's okay. and we don't have any women competing at at you know that kind of level that they could win a a major tour mm-hmm. so um i mean i think it's it's you know it's just a a harder sport for for women to get into yeah. um so, so it does take time and um i mean i have you know quite strong views about women cycling generally in that you know it's still not getting the kind of publicity that it should and therefore becoming a professional women cyclist is very tough yeah and um i can't understand really why the uci still makes so little effort to get women cycling live on tv yeah um uh, and until that happens it's just not enough money in the sport so it's such a a struggle and i think without you know without enough exposure because if you think about it watching men cycle the tour de france probably inspires a lot of young boys to want to be cyclists yeah and because women cycling doesn't have that level of exposure i don't think women you know many women see that opportunity right So I think it's not just India it's glo- it's you know it's still globally got a long way to go. Yeah yeah that is very true. But here uh, nowadays what I see is uh, a little more participation is there uh, in events like um, breves and stuff mm. uh, rather than the races. Um, mm. maybe there is something there. and uh, in races i've seen a uh, few people like lena and um, samira uh, here and abirami in chennai and uh, mm. uh, nisha in goa these people uh, coming up in uh, participating in r- road races and uh, triathlons I, i hopefully things will improve um, there need to be more more such people uh, uh, 
as role models you have been a role model for uh, uh, many of these names that i just mentioned i think they will uh, carry that torch and uh, you know be uh, hopefully more people will come up uh, in in the sport in women yeah yeah and and it's true about the breves because i haven't cycled much i mean or participated in that scene but there are a lot of women doing great rides i think in in the breve circuit so that's fantastic yeah. to see um and po possibly from that more will want to get into into racing and yes i mean there is a, a small handful of of good um uh, women cycling um so i hope to see more of that it was very exciting um certainly when when sam and and lena and i were all cycling in bbch um because we used to be able to sort of go out and actually you know dominate the men's amateur race yeah. um the three of us which was fun to be able to when i say dominate at least sort of take control of it a bit because we'd be racing together and um that was a lot of fun so i hope yeah i hope that will continue and there'll be more people sort of taking it up and giving it a go yeah definitely definitely so <clears throat> you're talking about uh, uh, cycling over the years now you have uh, ridden what uh, nearly 9 years uh, in cycling mm. um and uh, you practice yoga and everything so uh, the motivation to uh, continue doing this activity uh, i am sure uh, there will be uh, dips in motivation at least i i face that issue uh, how do you deal with those uh, uh, lows hmm yeah yeah so you know i was saying early on in cycling i got a lot of fast easy gains but what typically happens is then you reach a point where you kind of level out so you don't necessarily see improvement and and in fact you will see you're not able to do things that maybe you were able to do and it is it is tough to motivate yourself through that um however that happens at the top of cycling a lot too yeah. i mean i reflect on sometimes you know there are people riding professionally who you know haven't had major successes for a long time and i'm not talking about people who just ride as domestics but people who are actually there to win right and they still keep going so you have to just love cycling and um i think also just know that if you keep at it and you keep out there you will find your groove again but you just can't always predict when that will come and right. you know sometimes right. you can just start a ride feeling lousy and then you start riding really strong or it can go the other way around um but what what motivates me to keep at cycling is is really that i think it's very deeply part of my identity so mm. um you know being fit um being part of that kind of scene it's very much part of who i am and i'm fortunate that i share that with my husband as well so it's you know whether i race or whether i don't race yeah. um being fit getting outdoors doing something to challenge myself and obviously in 10 years that'll probably be less than it is right now but it will still be doing that um i think is what keeps me going yeah and um yeah racing wise we'll see um i'm kind of adaptable in that sense i mean you know i did race some some very big amateur races and um that was amazing but it also takes a huge amount of dedication yeah um and time and i think you you know people like us we go through different phases in our life when sometimes we have time to train for 6 months for you know a world amateur championships and sometimes you just don't right and um you can find other goals So you know for example my plan was this year actually to race duathlons just because and and to race sprint duathlons because they're short and you don't have to put the huge amount of hours into training endurance to do them mm -hmm. and actually when we first came out here I did race a couple and then of course the whole season fell apart with covid and yeah. I haven't had another race since yeah. but I might do that again next year if the season gets back going again and it's mm -hmm. a different type of challenge you know it's maybe running 3 4 5k 
cycling 20k running three four five k but it's all out yeah. and um you know that maybe fits my life a little bit better right now where i don't have as quite as many hours to get out on the bike mm -hmm. um as i did say in the years when 2015 and 217 when i when i raced the grand fondos so um so you you know what i think one is 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 loving the sport and two is finding the goals that work for you at that time in your life yeah. and just going after those absolutely uh, great points both so um, you mentioned about uh, those two races in 2015 and uh, uh, 17 uh, let's talk uh, a little bit about those they, those were um, uci grand fondo finals right mm. how was the experience yeah. there Oh, that was incredible. I mean, qualifying for both was incredible too. Um, but 2015, I raced in Dubai to qualify. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, my first time um, riding a, a Grand Fondo qualifier. And, a spinny um, Saudi or something? Yeah. We, we, so we raced out in the desert and it started very early morning in the dark. And I had a crash, actually. I, I the person who, who won my age category crashed and I was on her wheel. So I crashed too. Um, and then we ended up racing together to get to the finish and we lost the Peloton at that point. But, um, and she still remained D boys, the good friend. She's an amazing woman. So that, that qualified me for Denmark. And then I went and, and raced in Denmark and that was amazing. Um, and I'd actually did the time trial and the road race. And I always remember with the time trial, I mean, everybody had super professional setups, you know, TT bikes with fancy wheels and all of that, which, which I actually did have a TT bike, um, not such fancy wheels, but I do remember kind of, you know, rolling down the start and the, that commentator, was it Rob Hatch or someone like that who commentates for the UCI saying, yeah. and it's Vicky Nicholson for Ireland. And that was a pretty cool feeling. Yes. Um, even if, you know, I didn't finish very far up the ranking in the race, but it was amazing to, to have that experience. And then to ride the course, which was a, a really tough course. There was a lot of turns and downhills and so on. This was in um, Alborg. Yes. Yeah. In Olber. And then the road race and you were there for that. That was, that was such a tough race because it was very windy. Yeah. Um, and just, yeah, just finishing that race was, was an amazing experience. And the, you know, the amount of, well, the whole atmosphere there of all these different cyclists from all over the world. Um, and again, you know, I was nowhere near being competitive and finishing in even the top half of my age category, um, so it really gave me a sense of what the level was like, you know, for, for women aged 50 to 54. And it was, yeah, it was like really, really, really high. Um, and again, in France, um, in fact, in my age category in France, we, we had the fastest time of all the women racing. Wow. Um, so it's interesting thing with amateur athletes, you can sometimes get very, very fast races in the older age categories because the people who stick with doing it, some of them are very, very good. And of course they're ex pros. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So France was also, was also tough. Um, I mean, those are races that you just have to, you have to give everything to that, you know, to that ride. And um, yeah, you learn a lot from those races, but it's also a lot of training. Mm -hmm. To, to, to be able to have, you know, to be able to sort of stick with a bunch and um, get a good race, you, you know, it takes, it takes a lot to train for that. Right. Um, Great. I, I, I was there uh, in 2015 uh, uh, in Alberg cheering you, uh, you know, you and Raj uh, taking part in that. Uh, it was, mm. the atmosphere was electric. It was as mm. if we were there uh, in TDF or something. And uh, mm. uh, as you said, uh, the same commentator who calls out names of those professionals was there, the UCI commentator, and uh, calling out your names. And uh, it was amazing to watch. And uh, it was a great uh, learning experience just being there with you people. Yeah, it, it does send shivers down my spine just thinking about those moments. They were very cool. Yeah. 
Yeah. And a lot of thanks to Raj, actually, because he was sort of the inspiration, I think, to all of us that we could do those races because Definitely. he was out there doing them and we knew him and he shared that with us. And, and I, you know, I, I doubt very much I probably would have gone and done that, but for him. And, and also, you know, just from the smaller details of finding the hotel to stay in and all of that that year, he did as well. So, yeah. you know, really kudos to him for all the encouragement I think he's given to, to us. Yeah, definitely. He has been a, a kind of mentor for us uh, in those things, uh, like be it those races, be it um, the uh, Giro di Dolomiti, all these, uh, you, you know, he was one of the guys who, you know, got us out there and experienced something other than uh, BBCH and uh, TFN and stuff like that. yes yes well he would always tell us not to stay in our own little bubble and get out there and 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 that is the thing i mean so 2017 was the first time i did the giro del dolomiti and um then a few weeks later i i i raced in the grand fondo finals in in albi and that was that was an amazing summer and and harry and i went and stayed in well we were in italy for a few weeks and then we went to france i was really lucky my brother lent us his house for a month. So we went straight from Giro del Dolomiti to France and then trained there for a few weeks in, in the run up to Albi. And great experience. I mean, the first time doing Giro del Dolomiti was, uh, was amazing. That was so tough as well. Mm. Um, you know, I don't know how I finished that race. Well, I came close to not. Again, I had a crash in that race and, um, our wheels, our wheel rims melted, and <laughs> right, the carbon <laughs> rims. So many adventures, yeah. The carbon yeah. rims. Wow, okay. And uh, of course, lots of people helped us out, and we survived, and we did make it make it through to the end of the race. But it was, I realized um, that I needed to train more miles on the bike at that time mm -hmm. because um, I wasn't really fit enough to enjoy it. And that's what I actually, um, that, you know, that's, that's what I did between then and doing the second uh, GDD in 2019 was just do a lot more um, miles. Um, and when I went back in 2019 with you and, and Aravind and the others, yeah. um, I really enjoyed it that year um, because I think I was just fitter for being able to sort of keep going on those really long days. Yeah. Uh -huh. Staying in the group and taking those uh, on those long um, climbs and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, when you go to a race like that and you just see the kind of level of, um, I mean, those are, you know, they're, they're good amateurs, um, uh -huh. but, but, you know, everyone is, is fairly decent. Right. And um, that's again, an amazing thing to go and do because it just gives you a sense of what your potential is. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's it's wherever you are, even if you're really starting out and you think you're very slow, it's still getting out there and just trying to ride with people a little bit better than you to yeah. elevate yourself. Yeah. And then, you know, whenever you get to that next level going again. So it, if you want to continue to to grow and get stronger as a cyclist, because you get really lifted by the quality of people around you. Yeah. Um, and I was amazed by I think if you remember, there was. Um, that year there was a woman in my age category mm -hmm. um, who was who well who was way stronger than any of you guys yeah um, and I think was stronger than Raj actually I think she was she finished further up the category and that's that's pretty inspiring to see a woman in her early fifties yeah you know riding to that level she was Dutch of course yeah so <laughs> many. Yeah. There are so many inspirational people we meet there. Yeah. Yeah. As a leadership hmm. coach and um, you cycling and uh, yoga. So how do they, uh, do you think they complement each other? Or do you think uh, one contributes to the betterment in the other or vice versa? Yeah, I think both contribute to, to each other because um, um, so you know, my work in leadership is really about helping people find their potential and their learning edge. So stretching themselves um, 
And I'm not talking about going way out of your comfort zone, but going to, you know, beyond your comfort zone to a, a level where you're learning something new and discovering more about what you can do. And um, that's what a lot of, you know, what we're doing with people in groups or individually. And it's, it's very similar in, in sport. So the two really link for me. And it's interesting because for quite a while after I started cycling, I didn't really merge those two aspects. So I had my kind of life as a cyclist. And then I had my life as, you know, a consultant on organizational development and leadership. But then I started to realize how much actually those two things do merge. So um, now I, I see it as much more integrated um, and much more kind of, of of who I am as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, and also just the value of physical fitness in, in being able to handle stress and be resilient and pressure because I've been running my own business, you know, since my early thirties and it's not easy. And um, you go through a lot of ups and downs and a lot of time when you don't have security um, about, you know, where you're going to get the next um, income from or how the next year is going to pan out. And I just think having had um, the learning from sport and the resilience that cycling has taught me has helped me a lot too with being resilient as a, as a business person of any kind. Yeah. So yeah, the, the two are, are, are very connected. Um, I think in, in my life. Great. So uh, yes, they're connected and uh, you know, they, they help each other in a, uh, you know, very practical uh, way, but uh, at the end of the day, you have to do, uh, you know, X, A, B, C, in at work and you know so much uh, you know this workout and that workout uh, when it comes to cycling or running Mm. or yoga so how do you manage uh, the schedule and uh, keep them both going at a good level Mm. um yeah it's it takes it's not easy Mm. um And, you know, there's two ways of looking at it. When you have your own business, yes, you do own your own time a bit more. Mm -hmm. Um, However, in many ways, when you have your own business, you you also are very, are are more stretched, you know? So, so there's two sides to that, that coin. Um, And, um, well, when I've been training for races, the best way is to have a, a workout schedule that you've put together and you obviously will have a work schedule as well. And you've just got to find a way of making those work and you you train, you know, you can set out and you get clear about how many hours can I put into this per week? Mm -hmm. And you make sure that those hours you use them to their maximum potential. So, you know, for example, you can have a lot of empty hours on the bike where you just cycle along um which are great if you have the time and space for when i say empty hours they're not really hard training hours yeah but if you you know you're saying to yourself well i can only spend 10 hours cycling a week then you have to make every one of those hours count right um and and use them in a in a conscious way to a particular goal and i think that's the other thing is what are you training for because are you training, you know, to do a 20 kilometer time trial or are you training to go and ride a seven day stage race? You know, it's a totally different type of training and you have to fit something that fits for your time in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, so so yeah, being practical about, you know, what hours you have and how do you best use them? Yeah. Planning well and just executing that. Right. And knowing that life's going to intervene, right? We'll all have stuff that comes up. Yeah. Uh, you know, maybe a relative falls sick or maybe you fall sick or maybe there's something going on with your child or, and, and that will come up and it, it has to take a priority sometimes. Yeah. And, you know, I think being a bit self-compassionate about that um, and accepting that that's how it is and taking that time, doing what you need to do, and then you know coming back to it again. Yeah. Um, because we will, we will always have those things that that come up, and we we have to kind of balance what's important, what's important in life. Um, 
So, you know, there's a degree of ruthless prioritization, um, but then there's also self-compassion when you know that something else pulls you away and you, you have to take time out for that. Absolutely great point there. Yes. So any, uh, any more tips for uh, the working athletes on how they can juggle and stay balanced? Well, I think, you, you know, you've got to look at the stage that you're at in your life and, you know, what's, what's realistic and practical for you. Um, because, you know, if you're 21 and you're single, um, you may be able to devote all your non-working hours to training. Yeah. But if you're 35 and you've got two young kids and you're just trying to really make it in your career, you know, you, you, may, have, you may have less hours. It doesn't mean, though, you still can't achieve something. Yeah. Um, but maybe look for, you know, and if you are wanting to race, look for the kinds of races that you feel you can train for and you have enough time for, or maybe pick certain times of year that you go after things yeah. um, and certain times of year when you take time out. Um, so, you know, really be realistic about your your life and your goals and, and what's important to you. And of course, I mean, we've been talking a lot about racing and right now I'm not racing at all. Well, most of us are not racing, right? Yeah. Unless we're professionals. Right. So um, in fact, this whole year, apart from doing two duathlons, I don't think I'm going to race. So I'm using this time to kind of go back to basics and try and build a bit more strength because now I have time to go to the gym and, and do that kind of work. Um, I don't have to worry about sort of, am I getting in enough for a race that's coming up? Yeah. Um, so it's, it, it's also kind of adapting to circumstances and, and also the longer term thing is what do you want, you know, what do you want to be when you're 60? Yeah. Um, Cause that's also, it, it's hard to think about that at 20. I agree. But <laughs> maybe post 40, you can think about that. <laughs> Because then you want to train to look after yourself and, and maybe really do an all round balance. You know, we haven't talked much about training with strength and training with yoga and, and yeah. doing all of those things as well. So that, you know, your body is going to be healthy and keep you going for years. I mean, yeah. I'm pretty inspired by my mother who, you know, just died last year in her 90s. And she just bought a, a new pair of, of trainers, you know, just before she died a couple of months because she was still out walking um, and playing competitive bowls and, you know, doing a whole lot of things. Yeah. Um, and, I, you know, I'd like to think that I could be doing that right through my life. So I'd also train with an eye in mind the kind of longer term. Yes, definitely. So that that's a great uh, point to uh, wrap things up on uh, you know adapting to the situations and uh, doing something that keeps you going uh, is very important yeah. and yeah. not judging yourself by other people you know i think have your own your own goals your own ambitions yeah. um and it, it, you know from if you haven't cycled at all and you can get to the point where, you know, you can go and cycle 100 kilometers at any speed. That's an amazing achievement. And be proud of that. Um, and, you know, progress from there. Thanks, Vicky. It's been a great, great, uh, you know, uh, session here uh, with you. L learned a lot of, uh, uh, you know, important points about um, managing yourself, testing yourself and uh, being compassionate to yourself, uh, among other things. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, thanks again for taking the time and uh, spending with the Working Athletes Podcast. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks for having me.